So what's going to happen on May 29th is going to be the most interesting and probably the most bonkers election since 1994. A possible 350 political parties on the ballot. And for the first time, independent candidates as well. So let's stop with the foreplay and get down to business. Let's meet some of the most significant players. Musi Maimane is the former DA leader now heading his own political outfit, Build One South Africa. Songhezo Zibi is the leader of a new party making serious waves. They are very popular among white people, as you can tell. <laughs> Rise and Zansi. Zaki Ahmad, a veteran activist of unimpeachable integrity, now standing as an independent candidate. And they are joined by the DA's miracle mayor of Umgeni municipality, Chris Pappas. Moderating the conversation, jeepers, you guys had a little summon in that coffee. Moderating the conversation, Daily Mavericks powerhouse duo of Ferial Hafiji and Nonko Njilo. Hello, everybody. It's delightful to be with you. So in Joburg, this panel was going to look very different. This audience is going to look very different, eh? I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I mean to clean up so nicely and we have no water in Joburg, eh? <laughs> so be happy, Cape Town. Um, this is, I'm extremely delighted to be here with all of you. Because I think that the thing that's not often captured in our political discourse is that amazing South Africans have put up their hand and said, I want to lead, get into the arena. And for me, that's been enormously inspiring. So it's a new blood panel. And earlier when Mark said, we need a president under 45 years old, here we go. <laughs> Um, so, I would like to start um, by asking Zaki a question. Um, Zaki Ahmed has put up his hand um, to make use of the first time um, provision for independent candidates. For me, this has been one of the most exciting innovations of the election 2024. I'd like to know what your journey has been like, but firstly, I would like to honor you for the work you did in bringing ARVs to South Africa. <laughs> for so bravely turning around the death trajectory of HIV and AIDS in our country. For Ndifuna Kwasi, which works so amazingly to overturn the spatial apartheid that continue to bedevil our cities. And finally, for your work with Unite Behind, which is geared towards free, public, free good public transport and which has been an excellent watchdog of Prasa. So for all those work, thank you, Zaki. And I wonder what takes you from outside, from the streets, from the streets of revolution, inside the halls of power, and how could you make a difference as one person? Uh, thank you, Ferial. Um, I think we have two gay people entering politics. Well, he's, he's in it already, political parties. So I think he deserves a round of applause for being a queer politician in KZN. <laughs> Ferial was going to steal that line. <laughs> I was going to. What he actually said I must ask is, um, so Zaki, I believe you're a sex worker. Are you still practicing? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I did practice when I was very young. Okay. And I believe in the decriminalization of sex work. <laughs> um, so let me, let me say this. If we look globally... We've got genocide, we've got war, we've got economic collapse, we have incredible wars in Sudan, in uh, DRC, and so on. These are things that affect every one of us. One of the, one of the worst things that is happening is the absence of trust 
in representative politics and in the institutions of parliament, the Congress of the US, the European Union. Uh, I don't even know whether people know there's such a thing as a pan-African parliament, which should really be one of the greatest institutions on our continent. So people have lost faith in a representative democracy. What is critical for us, for every one of us, is to focus on what the Constitution promises us. And that promise is twofold. Of course it talks about representative democracy. But what it talks about mostly is participatory democracy and participatory governance. And what is taking me into politics is Ferial mentioned the, the work that has been done by Unite Behind in Prata. We have worked to uncover corrupt judge, Justice Makubele, corrupt MPs, corrupt businesses, and so on. And what I believe is that every one of us here need to commit to fixing the state. Because without fixing the state and without ensuring that people like you understand what Section 195 of the Constitution is, which speaks about professional, ethical, accountable, and open government, a public administration. I always say to people, it doesn't matter what's in the Bill of Rights. We will not realize the Bill of Rights unless we fix the state and unless we have the implementation of Section 195. And Bernstein spoke here, and it's not often that I agree with her, particularly on low wages. But she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right, Ferial, that unless we fix our municipalities, unless we fix our state-owned entities, any promise, any promise of jobs, water, and so on, is gone. And I want to work with any MP of integrity to say this. We have to understand the global economy and global politics. We have to understand what is happening in our country. Not only focus on ourselves. I want to work with MPs to fix the state. I want to work with them to pay attention to, to pay attention to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. If someone does, I want to do public transport with a focus on rail, because it's the most affordable. That's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Noko, over to you. Thank you so much, Ferial. I quickly want to ask Mr. Songezo Zebi a question. <laughs> Mr. Zebi, you obviously launched Rise on Zansi, I think it was 11 months ago, and you have literally been shaking things up. But the reality is you do not have a politics background. You come from mainly corporate. So my question to you is, what made you jump into the political arena? And I'm asking you this because we are headed into an election that is likely to be dominated by populists. And I'm tempted to say, you know, the EFFs, Julius Malema, the Patriotic Alliances, Gayton McKenzie, etc. Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. So just now, Zeki spoke about participatory democracy we have over time believed a lie in South Africa that in order to participate in politics meaningfully, you must be a professional politician. And we bulk at the notion of somebody being in politics first and moving on to do other things, or starting somewhere else and eventually wanting to do public service. I think we must try as hard as, as far as possible to dismiss that notion because the capable state that Zeki is talking about is not going to happen if we have a belief that if you start in the private sector, you stay in the private sector for the rest of your life. And then we sit in gatherings like this and also say that the public sector is useless. 
we need to start believing in the possibility of a revolving door between the public and the private sectors. Because, because the people that work in the private sector depend entirely on the public sector. It must be normal for somebody who is a lawyer, who is an accountant, who works for an accounting firm, to say, I am going to save my municipality. And they can do that for 10 years, 15 years, and if there's an opportunity in the private sector, they can go again. So I think it's important that as far as participatory democracy is concerned, we begin to see the interdependency between these two. They don't live in silos. The second thing on populism that I want to say is that actually the reason most South Africans do not vote is because they're not stupid. <laughs> out of 41 million, out of 41 million South Africans in 2021 who were eligible to vote, 28 million didn't. And part of the reason is the politics that promises you anything you're asking for, you will get it. People aren't stupid. They know it is not going to happen. And they don't turn up to vote because there is an unseriousness among the so-called professional politicians, which manifests in the things they offer to the electorate. So what am I and my colleagues after is a more honest politics, where if something is not possible, you say to people that it is not possible in a year or in two years. It's possible in five years. People get that. They don't get offended. They appreciate the honesty. And so the corporate background, finally, also tends to create a picture that people are born in boardrooms. Nobody is born in a boardroom. I wasn't. I come from a village. I have a house in the village. My mother lives in the village. I call it my home. And the dichotomy of South Africa's life and history is that I could be in a board meeting at 11 on Friday and slaughtering a sheep at 6 in the afternoon, in the village. And the black people in this room know it. And so this belief that if you were in the public sector, you won't do well in the private sector because you are incompetent. If you were in the private sector, you won't do well in politics because you don't understand the country that has birthed and raised you. And we must destroy those notions and encourage people like myself, and others to participate in politics at some point in their lives to create the country that we, when we sit in the private sector, we wish existed. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, Zungezo. Um, um, Chris Papas, my question to you is going to be different until I heard this data point from Roger Jardine's Change Starts Now baseline survey which I think made him change stats later, maybe, because of what it showed. But very interestingly, a question was asked to, 30, to uh, the biggest um, sample we've, we've got yet. Um, would you vote for a colored person? Because obviously they were polling for Roger. And the majority view that came back from people was yes. Actually, we're more concerned with governance, with changing our lives. And that was interesting because it was counterfactual to the belief that we in South Africa will only be able to elect a black African male um, as president. That's always been the received wisdom, at least in the ANC that I've covered for many years. So here you are, a young, white, gay, Zulu-speaking politician with a great history in the Mgeni municipality, and you want to be Premier of KZN? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> so, thank, thank you very much for having me, and, and welcome to, to the friends and guests on stage as well. Yes, while the things have happened in KZN, um, <laughs> while sure. the things have happened in <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> but I, I think you, you started off correctly. Um, when, when you get on an aeroplane and you're flying from Cape Town to Durban or to Johannesburg and the, you know, the pilot comes online and it is a, a female pilot, you don't worry that the pilot is female or what color that pilot is. You worry that that pilot can get you to where you need to go safely and that they're qualified. When your ge geezer bursts and you call a plumber, you don't worry about whether or not that plumber is, is black or white or colored or Indian. You worry whether or not that person is going to save your house from, from flooding. 
And South Africa and KwaZulu-Natal is flooding. And we need plumbers who can fix the problem. We need electricians, regardless of their, their race or their backgrounds, um, politics or not, who can fix the problem. Now, that's not to say we haven't got important conversations still to have as South Africans around uh, discrimination, around historical imbalances, inequality. That's, that's not dismissing those important conversations that we have to have. But what it does say is that at this particular point in time, as a nation and as a province where I come from, we have to make a serious choice about how and what we want the future to look like. Are we going to exist uh, at this level, at 30,000 foot, having conversations that are not putting bread on the table, are not fixing potholes, are not growing the economy, which is often what happens when it comes to elections. We don't actually talk about the real issues. Uh, we don't talk about how we're going to reduce crime. We end up pointing fingers and shouting at each other as politicians or people who exist in the political space. So we're going to an election where people want plumbers and electricians and they want doctors and pilots who are sufficiently qualified and sufficiently, uh, who have the sufficient expertise to be able to fix the serious, serious challenges that we've heard people unpacking today. Um, can I follow up there? So the DA completely scrubs black economic empowerment of any shape or form from its manifesto. Um, I think it's a mistake. How, does, how do you sell that in a province like KZN, where I would think that the requirement of black empowerment is still a very necessary one to take with you on the stumps? How's that going down? Sure, so I think we, we must differentiate between you know, the concept of empowering black South Africans uh, who are the majority, in, in, who are majority disadvantaged in, in, our, in our country, and especially in KZN and the policy of the African National Congress known as broad based black economic empowerment. Now that is a failed policy. Why is it a failed policy? Because it's the same people getting the same tenders over and over again until you've created an elite that is untouchable, while real business people who are trying to grow their organizations at a grassroots level are, are not getting the support that they need. What we really need to see is the word itself, black economic empowerment, not the ANC's policy, but an entire transformation entire empowerment of a class of people or a group of people who have been systematically excluded from benefiting from the economy. And that means scrapping the ANC's version of black economic empowerment. It means, it means making, sure, making sure that a small black business owner can participate, yeah. whether it's in, in, in government tender systems or, 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 or big business, and incentivizing that through a system that is different to what we have now, because it is clearly not working. And when you speak to people who are the beneficiaries or the people who have been excluded from the system, as you're saying, how is that going down? It's welcomed with an applause like this. To say, the average black business owner who's really trying to push their business and really trying to grow is being excluded politically, is being excluded because they do not meet the extensive red tape that is around uh, you know, any sort of procurement and government especially, and is being excluded because the system does not allow them to participate and grow as it stands. So, yes, we need to ensure that there is black economic empowerment, but not the current policies that we see being run by our government. Thank you very much. I have many questions, but non Leko, back to you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Maimane, you are a man that needs no introduction. In fact, I'm tempted to say you've been there, done that. But the reality <laughs> is you want to get... He's got the scars. Want, come again? He's got the scars. <laughs> exactly. But the reality is you want to go back to parliament. I mean, this time around, as a um, head of a different political party, I suppose my question is, what's different to between BOSA and the DA. And just a quick follow-up, the reality is you might have to work with the very DA in these upcoming elections. What's your take on that? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, to our fellow panelists, it's great to be here. Nice to see you again, Farrell. Nice to see you. Thank you for hosting. There's, you've all heard the poem about the man in the arena. Part of the journey is about learning how to face successes, as we learned some incredible things in 2016 about how to manage coalitions. You can recall the fact that even the coalition in Joburg were able to have Herman Mashaba remain mayor from 2016 to 2019, but that takes particular leadership. So there's that skill. There are some very 
difficult moments when you confront elections in 2019 and how tempting it is in this country still to confront a vision that says to you, you want to truly build one South Africa upon which all citizens, black and white, can prosper together. And you realize that at times when you go to the poll, sometimes people want to hark back to their own racial groupings. That's painful. But the truth of the matter is that you should never step off the arena. You should bring that experience. And so when I left Parliament in 2019, I went out having understood that parliamentary experience, having come from the church community and civil society in that leadership, and said, what additional skills do I need to add to the arsenal if you want to stand up in a position of leadership? And I was able to spend a lot more time in business because often people in parliament who have never run a business don't know how to write policies for people who run businesses. So you need to be able to spend time understanding what certain pains and issues are that sit within that community. I then went into the academic world. I'm in the process of trying to complete a PhD now and hopefully it'll be done by the end of the year. So you ask what is different coming forward. At first, I come back a different person more tools to the arsenal. Secondly, we bring a different vision. I think the painful thing about our politics is that so many of them are a contestation about what's a better picture about yesterday. We are arguing whether it's Cyril or John or whether it's Cyril or Zuma or whatever. That debate is old. What we've got to answer the question for South Africans is what is their tomorrow going to look like? And that includes ANC South Africans, it includes DA South Africans. So when I'm bold enough to say I bring a vision about Build One South Africa, it's very clear about the battles that we fought and will continue to fight about if we don't fix the disparities in our country about what happens in Kailicha and what happens in Seapoint, and those two things must matter for all citizens, this country will never have peace and should not have peace. So I'm coming back with that fight. I'm coming back notionally with the question of going, one of the things we've missed as this country is miseducated South Africans. We call a child proficient at a subject when they've passed that 30%. Imagine the insanity of entering a plane that Chris was talking about and the pilot says, I've landed successfully 30% of my flights. <laughs> so what we have to do is not only bring that sense of vision and question. But I do think, lastly, one of the dilemmas that I think South Africans, we never need to be blind to, is that the last, and I don't want to call it nine wasted years or state capture years or anything like that, it's the last 15 or so years. We've seen institutional decay in a way that we don't fully appreciate. It's not just at local government, it's also at national government. Parliament is busy at this point in time not functioning as the accounting to be able to hold the executive account to, to account. We've got a speaker who's compromised. So what I bring with me this time is not just Musi Maimani, but it's a team of South Africans who we've gone to communities and said to them, nominate your best leaders, give them your signatures, and ultimately, we only qualify by the fact that you've got skills, you've got talent, and you don't come from politics, as Songhezo has said, but you come from the law firm and all of that. And so when you look at our list, I am convinced that I'm actually entering and bringing back to parliament one of the most talented, diverse group of South Africans that will be able to take the journey of where this country is at and write the next chapter. That's the difference. I'm really... I'm really keen for you to answer the question around the possibility of working with yeah. the DA. Um, is it perhaps not against your conviction? No, I, I, I genuinely have no issues with the DA. I think that part of the debate that I forced me to leave the DA was because there was a divergence of vision in certain aspects. When I said I wanted to genuinely work for one South Africa that includes all South Africans, there were others who rejected that notion, right? So I accept that point. But what I want to achieve is going, having worked with coalitions, having done the work of understanding how 
I'm privileged to be able to speak to Peter Grunewald as much as I can speak to Velenko Sitlabisa from the IFP and the respective leaders. I have no problem with speaking to John Stiernes and, and talking about where this country needs to go. But it has to be premised on this thing, and this is where the rider of this issue comes in. We have a plan, and we have to table a future in South Africa that says, how do we fix ESCOM? How do we fix Transnet? How do we keep people safe? How do we help our education? If we can't agree on those, whether we like each other or not is irrelevant. We cannot coalesce only to remove the ANC. We have to coalesce with the purpose of changing this country. That's my premise. Thank you, Musi. Um, Songhezo, if I may, I asked you this once before, but I'm going to ask it again for the purposes. The multi-party charter coalition, um, all the numbers are showing that it could do quite well. People don't know it as a concept, but if you look at the, ni the nine constituent parts of which only four parties are really well known, four or five, um, they were quite keen to have you as part of that coalition grouping, and you would easily have been a possible presidential candidate as part of that. Why did you decide not to go in there? There's a second part to this question. So say I vote for you, and say you don't become president, does that mean you just go back to business? Or <laughs> what do you and your people do? No? No, thank, thanks and then much. what are your numbers looking like? <laughs> so, so I mean, there were a couple of principal uh, issues with going with working out a coalition arrangement, uh, which on the face of it appears to primarily be just about unseating the ANC. But let's think about this rationally. So at the time the MPC comes out, we haven't held our convention at all to bring together all of these people that we've been working with in communities across South Africa and so on. And so you agree you go into this kind of arrangement representing who exactly? in that arrangement. So there's a legitimacy question there. The second thing is that we hadn't even tabled our manifesto, which we only tabled on the 20th of January. So when you invite someone to be in a coalition with you, you really have to know what they're about, <laughs> right? So these people haven't had a convention, they haven't tabled a manifesto, you want to get into, an, into a coalition with them. On what basis, really? That does sound like politics of convenience, right? So that is the second thing. The third thing is that the multi-party charter is not going to be on the ballot ultimately, right? It is still going to be the IFP competing against the DA, competing against the Freedom Front Plus, mm -hmm. and so on. So what proposition are you really placing to an electorate where you say we are together and yet we are not together? Because people make choices on the basis of what the political parties are saying to them. I can list 20 other reasons why, why this, this idea is not practical. That does not, however, mean we are not willing to work with the parties in the multi-party charter in order to build a... So you're not South ruling Africa. out... No, of course not. South Africa is going into a several electoral cycles of coalition government. We several must electoral cycles? Several, cycle. yes. We must accept. In fact, in this next election, we must accept the ANC will remain the biggest single political bloc right. in South Africa numerically. It will. We must accept that as a statistical fact and reckon with what it means for the kind of politics we want to have in order to take this country forward. It's just a fact. So not wanting to deal with the facts of what the politics is telling you is, is, is not wise. And, and the last point on this uh, that, uh, that I want to make is that we must also understand where South Africa is after 30 years. People are looking for a, for a new proposition of what South Africa should be like over the next 20, 30, 40 years, right? And the reality is that the old political parties have become stuck in electoral cycle politics, rather than asking the question of where South Africa is after 30 years, and how do we shape the future for the long term? And what does it mean for the things we must do in politics now, in 10 years, in 15 years, and 20 years? Which helps to answer the second question, which is, Raizim Mzanzi and myself and my colleagues are not here just for this election. We, there is a term we use 
in our vision, which is the things we want to do in one generation, which is 25 years. Which is 25 years. And you can't set out a vision and then stick around for a few months. And then when you don't, and then when you don't get the majority, you disappear. So we in it for the long term. We, our premiership candidates are all in their thirties, for instance, in Gauteng, in KZN, and here in the Western Cape. Because in five years' time, some of those people are not yet 40, they're, they're just over 40 years old. In 10 years' time, when they're not yet 50, you've got multiple options for a young president in South Africa. So we are very intentional about the long term and rising chances. This is not for convenience. If this was short term, I'd simply go and get a job somewhere and get, and get offered incentives on, on three to five year cycles, which is what happens in business. South Africa's future cannot be left to sh short term aspirations, unfortunately. Can't. Thank you. No. I think you, are, you have questions here. Okay. Will you? Um, before I go to our online questions, very well, I quickly want to ask Zeki, mm. should you garner the support you need to go to parliament, you would obviously be in the opposition benches. My question to you is, what does an effective opposition look like? Is it anything we have seen at all? That's a sweetheart question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's Daily Maverick today said Julius Malema attended eight out of 50 committee meetings. And for me, that says something. He accused me of, don't come to parliament, it's too boring. Uh, we welcome me and said, it's too boring. It's the boring work we have to do. Mm. You have to read the documents. You have to convince people. And what I am working with my comrades in, I know there's some of you who don't like the word comrade, <laughs> but I'm still used to it. I'm so old that I forget about it. But to go there, opposition politics in our country is an absolute mess. Absolute mess. If you look at ANC councillors in Kailicha, Guguletu, Nyanga, Philippi, Marikana, they try everything in their power to make the DA look bad, for example. So they won't push the DA. They won't push the DA to make sure that there's spatial justice, to make sure that uh, taps run and so on. The messier the place is, the better it is for them, or so they think. An opposition... Our job as opposition MPs, and I want to be a member of parliament. My example of a good MP is Helen Sussman. But what she didn't have is a movement. And what I believe we can build in Nkululeko is a people scoper outside, standing committee on public accounts. One that brings together anyone from any party, any community that is interested in discussing what's happening in education, what's happening, obviously I have my focuses. But if I look at what oppositions, uh, what MPs, all MPs, opposition and so on, do not do, don't do, there's a woman called Bongiwe Selinga. She is disabled. She has to walk on crutches because she cannot get a wheelchair into into a shack. And for me, it is about bringing her voice into Parliament so that she can tell Parliament what to do. It's about bringing the experts on people living with disability into Parliament so that they can tell Parliament what to do. Not my voice, not Julius's voice, not any of our voices here, but the people's voice. Thank you. Please come in, Musi. Yes. Yeah, because I think the point Zach is making is opposite. It's why you fight for the Electoral Amendment Bill. That's why we took it to the Concord and eventually it ended up back into the statutes of Parliament. It's so that whilst I celebrate the work that Zahi is doing as an independent candidate, actually the struggle that we wanted to fight should not have ended just at independent candidates. It needed to go to constituencies. So that at the end of the day, 
every member of parliament has to face up to citizens and respond to their issues. Jo Joburg, as we speak now, I always say to people in Joburg, when last did you bath? Because there's no water in Joburg. Some 12 of my days trekking. for some of my friends. Hey? 12 days. <laughs> I'm sure they bath, but you're not. You know, I can Charlo smell from here. Charlotte McClake, Charlotte McClake is a hospital is not working, certain wings. Who is the member of parliament who's speaking to the people of Johannesburg about that issue? So the sooner we amend the electoral act so that we can get politicians to serve the people legally and know that the constituency period that parliament gives them is actually meant for that, then we are advancing institutional democracy. Okay. But Lucy, no, but what did you do about your constituency allowance for MPs when you were in the DA and what constituencies actually work? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think it's part of the reason, one of the things that when I left Parliament was the recognition that the system isn't set up for the use. No, but you had money to do, to do work in constituencies. Did you use we it tasked, for that purpose? We tasked many of the MPs to be able to do that. I'm simply saying to you now, Zaki, that the laws of this country, at least previously, did not make that always easily possible. And now what I'm trying to make sure, that's why I took it to the Concord and that's why we're fighting but, for it more. So can I ask, so, so clearly, Bosa, if you get in, that'll be what you drive. Um, We've making, already started to you drive started it. started the process. We, but say you get in with your, what would be your optimum Wish to how many MPs do you think at this point you'd be able to get? I, I look at it and go at this point in yeah. time, post the signature process, post all of yeah. that, we are garnering more signatures. We want to get up over a million signatures before we get those are people <laughs> committed to vote for Bossa. And if we get that right, we'll be able to get over 40 members of parliament, which so will give us a significant voice. So optimally, 40, 40 members. How will you locate them in constituencies? Because I have no idea who my well, national constituency uh, exactly that. So what we've done is we've asked for each one of them to garner signatures from their constituencies. Before they could enter into our lists, we needed to make sure they represent someone. And they bring a set of competence, and then we train them, assess them, and make sure that they have no criminal records, there's no corruption charges against them. And then when you compile the list, you align people to where their constituency is. So that to Zahi's point, when all of these constituency budgets are allocated, you can then come back and say, Pharaoh, you may not have nominated person X, Kathy, who lives in your community, but now she serves in your community. She will set up an office that serves all the people because all that happens in the current political system is that you set up a constituency office, but it serves the party, not the people. So, Ayanda, so we've Kathy, it's all you. They've, they had to go out and do all that. Sorry? Ayanda, Kathy, Ayanda, they had to Kathy, go do all Nobuntu, that work. and so many others who come from particular communities and serve those Thank communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for giving us an indicator of where you think it could go to. Please, Nonko. Okay, I'll just take a couple of questions from the online platform. So we've got a question from Patrick. And he says the ANC is the problem. Why don't Zeki, Mosi, Songezo join the best hope of unseating it, the MPC? I'll take the second question as well, should we? Please. And the second question from Genevieve goes as follows. For each of our panelists, why should the youth vote? What role does the youth play in changing South Africa? Thank you very much. Who's going to take the MPC question? And then a minute each on youth vote. I think if you could take it, Songezo, briefly, like 30 seconds, because we're running out of time. And I think Musi as well. Yeah. We, we didn't join the MPC, and it's not because I oppose the parties in the MPC, I've got very good relationships with them. But I think all of us realize what the numerics of this election look like, right? If you put all the parties in the MPC collectively, they still don't get over 40%. They get they to don't. 38 which means you have a deficit of 12%. If Songezo joins, they get... So, so here is the basic point. So why don't you is that your, your 40 MPs to that? No, but my, here's my point. So why, 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 why don't you add your 40 MPs to that no, but Chris, and form a, a collective, not necessarily against the ANC, but against the problems that we see? Chris, it doesn't mean by suddenly... Uh, let me put this analogy to you. 
If I add Wimpy and Steers, it doesn't suddenly increase the burger market. Just because answer, answer people have come together does not automatically move them from 38 to 51. It's, it's not lunch what lunch. needs what to happen is that there are voters who are undecided at this point, are looking for a vision different to what the DA and some of those parties are offering. We have to speak to those voters, and if needs be, post the elections, you can then form a coalition. You don't need to do it before. But the Our MPC system is, is baked into that. that. The MPC is not a coalition. It's a group of organizations saying that we need something greater, a bigger vision for the country, other than, than individual political parties bickering. Like Songhezo was saying, to say, what is the plan for crime? What is the plan for education? What is the plan for whatever it might be? And the multi-party chart has come out, and I think it's now uh, electricity, it's uh, crime, and it's jobs, to say collectively, how can we solve this problem? They're not saying collectively we're going to sign a coalition agreement. What they're saying is we're trying to fix these collectively. And that's exactly what you said as well. So the question I go back to ask is, why, why not get behind something that is bringing about a little bit of hope? No, it's not that it is without hope. It is the fact that where we sit at the moment, when you look at any normal poll, there are many South Africans who say they don't know. They are undecided. They are looking for You're repeating it. a different set of leaders. We have to make that offer to them. There's no crime in being able to say... But Musi, isn't it post honest to say that you're going to, uh, going to coalition afterwards? You'll discuss a coalition afterwards. Hold on, let me finish. Yeah? You'll oh, go into coalition it. afterwards, after the election, electorate has voted for you. My position is very clear. I'll support any coalition that stands for the rule of law, and that, above all, is pro-working class. Yeah. That is the coalition Thank I will support, guys. and I make it very clear now. And I won't it's remove the government for three years. We have to get that youth. No, no, I have to Look finish. Look how little... I know, I know, but I don't get to finish. <laughs> get fi finish half Here's the last please. thing I'll say. I have already, Chris, brought a number of parties in various provinces oh, Jesus. who are working with BOSA to say BOSA will be on the ballot. So that coalition has already been established that is outside. The MPC still has all of those parties on the ballot. We're saying we are bringing a number of parties with BOSA on the ballot Thank you for guys. them to support. Okay, okay. And okay. let's move on to, our, to your offer for young, young voters. People. Just in a minute, because you can see we're running out of time. Songhezo, please go ahead. The importance of the youth voting. Of the youth. So we've decided to place the youth at the center of our leadership, at the center of our politics, and at, at the center of our organizing. I think one of the things you will see, even in our electoral list, the youngest candidate, I think, is 21 years old, and the majority of them are, are under, under 40 years old. I think the message that we have for young South Africans is that it is not for political parties to do things for you while you stay outside the political system. Mm -hmm. You need to be inside the political system, inside politics, in political leadership, not as a league in the top deciding structures of South African politics so that you can drive the issues that are important for young people in South Africa. And we've decided to do that in practice by integrating young people into all leadership and political structures of our organization and our elections list. Your Western Cape Premier candidate is something else. Huh? Yeah, he's Cornelia, brilliant. Yeah. It, people really should meet the guy. Uh, Chris Pappas. So How old are you, just to remind people? Me, 33 half. 33. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, can I speak more broadly? Because it, uh, um, I think it's applicable to everyone. There, there's three things. Control, power, and hope. The opposite of control is anger. People get angry because they don't have control of their future, they don't have control of employment, they don't have control over government, over crime, whatever it might be. People are, are hopeless because they wake up, it's like a national depression. You wake up every day and you can't see something brighter in the future. And that's what hopelessness is, the lack of ability to see something brighter in the future. Mm -hmm. And the last one is power, because the opposite of power is powerlessness. And no one wants to be powerless when you face so many problems. So whether you're young or old, rural or urban, 
politician or not, we want to regain control of our lives and our future. We want to believe that there's hope for tomorrow. And we want, we want the power to be able to determine what that future looks like. And I think regardless of, of all these things, whether it's you're young or old, whatever it might be, we must find representation in parliaments and legislatures and council and civil movements to make sure that we regain those three things. Thank you. Zaki. I believe that young people are not the future. They now. Mm. Young people are now, not the future. Mm. And that is what Youth in Action, the movement that supports my campaign, is called. Not the future now. I've worked since, since I was 14. 90% of the work has been with young people. As Firiel said, Treatment Action campaign, it was young women who changed the country, not me. Similarly, in, uh, you mentioned the Western Cape Premier's candidate of Songhez on them. We built the Social Justice Coalition together. We built a range of campaigns together. My chair of my campaign is Zuki Vuka, who comes out of equal education. She's now 35. She's ready. She doesn't want to, but she's ready to go to parliament. She spent the last seven years studying, studying documents on state capture. Those are the type of young people we want and need to have in this country, not the type that are running around in MK, EFF, and elsewhere. I believe that we, as older people, have a duty to support. That's our job, not to lead. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, You're going to answer on young voters, eh? I, 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 I'll, I'll be quick, because there are two opposite points I want to say to you, the young people I've worked with. Is that not only have we allowed people like Ayanda Ali to come to parliament as young South Africans, After one of the things I enjoyed doing was during COVID, we were able to set up a blended learning center for young people in education. And youth came together and said, can we move our maths marks further up? The offer isn't what we can or what we're going to do. The offer is in many ways that we have been working together with young people to set up these centers so that they can improve maths marks from 30% to 50%. And all the ask is, let's be able to replicate that nationally so that wherever you are born doesn't determine the quality of education you get. That's it. Thank you. Um, so we're nearly out of time. Final question for each panelist. I've always wanted to be Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, <laughs> and the power vested in me, you are now president. Um, so, Zaki, say you've been um, voted in, independent. What's your first bit of business? Very sharp, because we're out of time. Hmm? My first bit of business is to ensure that the contract I've signed with Zaki 2024 supporters to set up a people's scoper and to <coughs> make people understand what is going on in Parliament that's my first order of business, followed and do it, not only by myself, but with any member of parliament who wants to join a study group based on integrity and truth. Thank you. Chris Papas, your KZN Premier. First thing. So the first thing that I would do is get my hands on every single document, every single computer, every, everything before the evidence of 30 years of mismanagement, corruption, Malibu. abuse of power, malfeasance is destroyed. Because that's where you start to rebuild accountability. Thank you very much. <laughs> the same are your presidency be on maybe. <laughs> First thing. If I'm president. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. <laughs> own it, own it. <laughs> No, I think, I think that the number one thing, I think, as an emergency right now is eliminated food hunger. One of the things I have experienced and it's gutted me every time, ferial people don't have enough food to eat in South Africa. Mothers die by suicide and take the lives of their kids. It's not a cliche. We ask all the time. Usually people have not eaten in 24 hours. We, we can't sit here and 
and talk about a lot of important things when people are really hungry. So food. 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 From pastor to president. Yeah. First thing. I mean, that promise of a, trying to put a job in every home can only be achieved. And you asked me what the first task is. Let's get the best people working for the state in the best departments. Because it doesn't matter how we promise. If we don't have the best players on the field, we cannot achieve much. And that's what the ANC has stolen. And that's what we've got to rebuild if we're going to build this country. Thank you. My colleague, Nonku. Um, so many people are saying to us here, asking the guys, where are the women in politics? I have to tell you, they are Adler. not. <laughs> Pat for Premier is the most prominent you're going to get. It's a very patriarchal election, I'm afraid to say. True. Um, the most that I've seen since 94, and I've covered each one. So, Nonku, final word to you. Say, you're the president. What do you think the most <laughs> urgent thing that you Me? Need? What do you think South Africa needs most <laughs> you know, as a young South African? I think we need credible leaders. That's it. If you're credible, you probably have the will. You probably will be accountable, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind times. We'll see you back after lunch.